years ago, I began to wake up. It happened during the darkest days of my life. We've all been there, but this time, the thought of a single blade of grass would become a symbol of gratitude for me. The smallest and at the same time most powerful link to bring me back to the light. Since then, I've often wondered, can we really think our way into tragedy or triumph? If so, what do we want? What do we really want? Love, health, career, financial abundance? Four people share their stories about how they thought their way back from the brink to a life of their dreams. Daniel Bax. I smashed into the back of the van, blowing myself through the back window, and I was not expected to survive. I flatlined once on the way to hospital and three times during surgery. And if you're without oxygen for more than seven minutes, you're classified as brain damaged. I was without oxygen, from what I was told, 20 minutes. Daniel was rated catastrophic, uh, which most people don't come back from. All I remember is the detective on the phone telling me that we were heading down to Hamilton to identify a body. When they woke me out of the coma 10 days later, I was temporarily blind, deaf, muted, fully paralyzed on my left side, and memory was completely erased. I knew nothing, not my family, not myself, not how to scratch an itch, nothing. So I was literally reborn in 2006. When I was a kid, I was always the guy pushing the limits, doing the extreme, going just beyond where everybody else would stop. I'd go a little further. And people call me Daredevil Dan. It's because I always just pushed the extremes. It's like if they said you couldn't do it, I went out and did it. As I advanced going through the bike riding, it was just bigger jumps, bigger gaps, bigger hills, bigger ledges. Daniel, as a child, was feisty. Um, he had a bit of a temper. I was pissed off at life. I was just, which is probably the reason why I got in so many damn accidents or had so many injuries, because I was just pissed off. I didn't care. I thought I was indestructible. If I destroy myself, yeah, better be dead than alive, but I wasn't going to take my life. It just happened to make it. If it happens to one of my sports, then it happens. Subconsciously, my mind just said, you're not worth it. What if the ultimate love story is to love oneself? Easier said than done when we are often our own worst critic. Tamara Harrison has faced her fears, breaking away from the mold after achieving a much sought after career in Silicon Valley. I had my dream job. I had my house, a great car, great vacations. I had just gotten married. And I think I really naively believed that that was gonna fix whatever was, was not right for me. I've got everything that I could possibly want, but, but something's not right. At the end of the day, I felt empty. My name is Tamara Harrison. I have a spiritual name, which is um, Deva Garima, and it means divine grace. We are in a um, meditation temple in Nevada City, California. Part of the reason I'm here is for being in meditation sangha and our singing sangha. Sangha is um, a group of people that come together and are sharing in their practice. What I can say about kind of where it all began, <laughs> so I studied math and computer science and moved to Silicon Valley upon graduation and started the corporate life. On the outside, it did look like, wow, but I literally was crying every day to go to work. I just, I didn't know how I could go one more day. There was something in me that's just like, there has got to be something more. I, it was hard to face. It was like, well, what am I gonna do? 
it was my whole identity. A life of abundance is what we strive for, but what happens when you have it all and then lose it all? For Sophie Solomon, sudden financial devastation, as well as postpartum depression, a condition impacting many mothers, sent her on a journey she never expected. I had thoughts of killing my baby. I would cry, I would sit there in despair. I couldn't understand what I'd done to my life. I just started to spiral into this world that felt very isolated, nobody understood me. And the thing was, I'd never had depression in my life. It wasn't something I was used to. I thought I was insane. I was going insane. I remember worrying about her because I started to notice that she always had her sunglasses on. So it didn't matter what the weather was like. It could be a dark, rainy day. She would have her sunglasses on outside and her sunglasses inside. And I remember saying to my husband, I'm really worried about Sophie. Like, I'm wondering if she's on drugs or she's taking something. So my body got into a pattern of not sleeping. And I remember trying so hard to sleep. It, would, it became like an all-consuming obsession. I knew she wasn't sleeping a lot, and I thought that was really what it was. She was never getting any sleep, but she wasn't getting any sleep because of the postpartum. It wasn't the other way around. I was so lost in my world of depression that I knew that things weren't going very well. But then when my second son was born was when things got much worse financially. My partner came to me and said, we just lost $250,000. At the time, I was making $26,000 a year working as a travel agent. I was in panic mode, I really was. And I, you know, it's, it's very daunting when you're getting, uh, when the government is coming after you. So things went very bad very quickly. So we went from being really abundant, all of a sudden it was all, you know, we were hanging by a thread. From an impoverished start in India, Satish Verma left the country of his birth to start a new life and a successful career. Then one day, all that he had built and saved crumbled into financial ruin and bankruptcy. You can call me slumdog millionaire. I grew up in the, those environments, you know, when I was, I was a little kid. Well, 28 years ago, I had, I had made some money and then I, I lost it like overnight investments. All my money, except a couple of thousand dollars in the bank. And, and two small children to support, and wife to support. And what do you do at that time? You're told you feel devastated. My only option at that time was, the time was bankruptcy. I, without question, recall not having a lot. It's, it's, it's evident in that, you know, your friends at schools have more than you. I'm sure there was a lot more stresses on him to put food on the table and to make sure that you know, me and my sister were okay. See, when you declare bankruptcy, this is what the people tell you. Oh, you've gone bankrupt. And they avoid you like a plague, as if you have, you are the biggest loser. And every person becomes your advisor. Everybody says, oh, you should have invested this way. You should have, we knew this will happen to you, as if they had a crystal ball in their hand <laughs> to predict my future. So, so at that time, you have only one friend on this planet, only one, your inner self. Since the discussion on manifesting and the law of attraction has exploded on the pop culture radar, it's been met with growing fascination and controversy. Tosha Silver is a leading expert and author with a unique view on the subject that came out of her own near-death experience. The focus of letting the divine take the lead really is about learning to listen on the inside to allow the intuition to take the lead. I grew up as very much that kind of type A driven personality that really is what the whole culture teaches. And there literally was a sign over my bed when I was about 13 that I had picked, nobody stuck it up there, that said, if you don't do it, it won't get done. And, you know, being 13 and already thinking that way was pretty exhausting. I went off and did all the typical driven, ambitious things, went to an Ivy League college, graduated, did all that and then got to about the age of 27 and was very, very sick. Like I had burned out my entire adrenal system. And over that illness, which pretty much put me in bed for three years, I had to learn a different way to live.
After crashing a motorcycle into the back of a van, Daniel Bax was told he would never walk, talk, or feed himself again. I was in hospitals and rehab for four years. And when they wheeled me in there, one of the nurses came up to me and said, Mr. Bax, welcome. What are your goals here? And I said, in my little whispery voice, I'll walk out of here in a year. He goes, to himself, I could see his mind going, I guess this guy doesn't know that he's screwed up, he's paralyzed, he's like never gonna walk again. There was so much talk around Daniel, like he wasn't there. Right in front of Daniel, they said, he will never walk, he will never talk, and he will never eat solid food. And Daniel tried to get himself up out of his wheelchair, looked at all the doctors and said, I will do it all. I thank the incident for erasing the memory. Because when they said, can't, I took it as I can. At the same time, that is someone else's opinion. And it, I will not allow that to become my reality because my, my opinion is that I will do what I think I will do. I will do what I intend to do and what I place my mind and focus on. The power of thought came into my healing through having a positive mental attitude. I just saw joy. I saw the fact that I'm alive. It's a beautiful thing. Daniel's one of those people that you meet in life that doesn't quite understand the word no. And it's just an amazing challenge for him if you tell him he can't do something, because he's going to do it. He's very driven to success and very driven to accomplishment. That determination stayed with me. And one day I went like this. Oh my gosh, it's moving. My mother came in the room and I wanted to show her my toe wiggled. Nothing. And I'm pointing really fierce. She goes, what, honey, what? She looks back down. Nothing. And so the question is here, how many times do we attempt something before we give up? Oftentimes, it's just before we achieve it, most people just give up. I pointed back down on my foot. She goes, do it again, do it again. And from that point on, it was toe to toes, to foot, to leg, to body. I left that hospital nine months walking. The Almighty has given us a power of mind, power of thought. And that's how we all human beings are equal. We are all given the same opportunities to succeed or to fail. When I was growing up, the town was Ferozpur uh, in uh, northwest part of India. There was no plumbing system. There was no running water. I'm the youngest of three boys. Uh, my mother was 23 years old when she became a widow. And then my mom, she could not even sign her name. She, she was totally illiterate. So basically, there was total devastation in the family. Then mom said, you know what? I have to feed my children. I have to do something about this. Or what if you become a midwife? So my mother could not read or write. So she started looking at the pictures and she learned everything from those pictures. And she got a certification. I said, anything is possible in life then. My mom had a tremendous positive influence on my life. Even though they were extremely poor and it was, in the, it was well known in the community that he was poor, that his mother never made him feel poor. She would always say, say, listen, you guys don't have to worry about anything. We were always rich, we'll always be rich. And that's the thought you grow up and you are just waiting for that to come in your life. I, I was going through great adversity in my personal life, uh, uh, financial, you know, relationship. Everything was in a mess at that time. I lost everything that I had. Somebody said, why don't you take a course on this? Think and grow rich. It's a practical philosophy of life, which was, research was done by Napoleon Hill on the minds of great business leaders. This think and grow rich is not about becoming rich uh, financially. This richness involves all areas of, our, all of your life. So it's be, being rich in your character, being rich in, as a good person, being rich in love. And they used to have a correspondence course in those days. And I, I sent them the money, that's the last $500 I had in my bank account. When I took my first lesson, and I was going to the trustee's office to sign my bankruptcy papers, and I could hardly wait to get out of his office. I said, hurry up, I want to sign, get it over with so I can start, with my, start my life all over again. As I got out, I said, great. I looked at the sun. I looked at the sunlight. I said, wow, new day for me, and never looked back. You know, all these moms in the play groups and the baby groups and all of that, and they're all so happy. You know, I just wanted to shoot them. They made me feel so 
bad about myself, at least at the time, that's what I felt. I lived next door to the president of the breastfeeding league, and I wasn't breastfeeding. So if you can imagine, I was feeling like the neighborhood pariah. I would talk to other mothers, and their advice was just worse to me. It never helped because they were just telling me everything I was doing wrong, and I wasn't making enough baby food, and I wasn't, you know, making homemade food for everybody, and natural diapers, and all of that stuff. There's a lot of pressure around being a perfect mother. So that just adds more fuel to the fire, it caused me to withdraw a lot. They have different levels of depression when people have children. You know, the, the mildest form is the baby blues, where you're just not sleeping, and they would say to me, oh, you've just got the baby blues. And I started, my behavior was, it was erratic. Things were really chaotic, they didn't have any money. Literally, I could see her fighting for her life, like fighting for the family, fighting financially. I started to resent the baby, I resented Colin. I descended into darkness. I mean, it just felt like complete darkness. Dr. Patricia Rockman teaches mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, among other techniques, to people who are experiencing stress, anxiety, or are suffering for any number of reasons. Life brings pain, right? You don't get through life without pain. It's not gonna happen, right? We all experience loss, aging, sickness, illness, death, etc. But what we can do something about is the suffering that we stick on top of that, right? Shinzen Young has an equation that suffering equals pain times resistance. Mindfulness deals with the resistance. So what do we do when difficulty shows up? So mindfulness is asking us to be with difficulty, to hold it in the same way that we hold the joys and the ecstatic moments of our lives so that it all becomes a level playing field. That's different than taking the position that, oh, I have a negative thought, I have to get rid of it, I have to replace it with a positive thought. I, do, I just don't think it's realistic and I actually don't think it works very well. You know, I didn't really share so much with other people because I think there was, there was such a turmoil inside myself. Um, I just like, you know, what's wrong with me? And deep need for approval outside myself. Um, so I, it depended a lot on what everyone else thought of me. The way the world contexts uh, successful human beings is very often uh, contrary to their actual nature. So there's always a very, very, it gets more solid as people make more effort. It's a tension. These are all like layers of walls that separate us from our true nature. And Part of that is necessary because the insensitivity of the environment that they're in uh, it would be almost intolerable. The lesson from a very young age tends to be think about what you want and go make it happen and be really frustrated until it occurs. Like, you know, really suffer until it occurs. And so this act of offering things to the divine and inviting it to participate Perhaps if we lived in a different culture, we would never have to do that. But the act of inviting it is pretty much the opposite of how we're taught to think in our default settings. After decades of research, leading neuroscientists have found that the brain is capable of changing for the better. Neuroplasticity and rebound is a subject that uh, is of great interest to all of us in brain injury rehabilitation, which is how much of our brain function, can we recover and how do we train it? So we know that the harder we work our brains, the better we're going to see a recovery. And the more we do, we know we do that to uh, stave off the effects of aging. Neurons that fire together wire together. So that which we think tends to lay down tracks and becomes more of what we see. Mindful attention brings uh, what are called more salient networks in the brain online. These are networks in the brain that come online when we are learning. And the other thing that mindfulness does is it starts to activate areas of the brain responsible for present moment experience. And what that does 
is that disrupts our habitual tendency to draw conclusions and explanations about our experience that may or may not be true, right? And can get us into trouble. So we are changing the brain. So we are developing, if you like, what we might refer to as traits, not states. Can, I will, I must. Beautiful words, and they came through a tremendous leader, Anthony Robbins. My family posted that and a handful of other quotes and statements by my bed. That's what I saw every morning, and that stuck in my mind. And when nurses or doctors or anybody said, even family said, Mr. Bax, you can't do this. I said, I can, I will, I must make a difference. I chose to cycle to my therapies, and I chose to cycle back. I then chose to take on therapy of myself at home doing push-ups, doing squats. I lived on the 22nd floor or something like that. I walked all 22 floors up to my house. I was just so inspired by Daniel. And then, you know, I would call on Daniel to help me with other clients who really were struggling, you know, and who really sort of didn't know how to get past that sort of um, what is now known as perceived injustice, you know, where they feel that, they, that they're the victim. Why did this happen to me? And they just often can't get past that. My purpose in life was, was, was given to me from the, from the moment I actually woke up. But to go around and let people know they can heal and, and they, they can have full wellness and it all begins with the power of thought. I'm the author of a self-evolution book called The Life of Your Choice. I wrote my book purposely to help other people. There's no better therapist than somebody that understands. And so Daniel is such an inspiration for so many people. The essence is just become the greatest being you can be. Like, do the most you can for yourself. It's not about competition. How can you better yourself and be on a consistent evolution of improving your way of being in life? It was almost like everything came tumbling down at once and it had to get to that point before, you know, what was my rock bottom to feel like, okay, I really have to shift this. I started to have an inkling that the way I thought would influence my life that the way I thought would create my life. Like, I could decide how my day is gonna go. I can choose for it to be a negative or a positive. I had a moment where I thought to myself, I could be that person sitting here living in despair, or I could just take some responsibility. Colin had always supported me and given us everything we wanted or needed, and it, it would be my turn to step up. And I made the conscious decision to you know, try, try my hand at real estate. It was like this moment of decision for her that she was gonna fix it. I followed the philosophy of baby steps, you know? I didn't wanna overwhelm myself and say, I need to turn everything around overnight. I knew I couldn't. How the power of thought and my thought process brought me back was, at that point I was addicted to sleeping pills. I was taking more than I was supposed to, so I decided I was just gonna go off them. I was gonna stop. And then made the ritual at night of taking a bath and then going to my bed. And once the baby was asleep, lying down and talking to myself and saying, you're gonna lie down, you're gonna rest, you may sleep, you may not sleep, but your body is resting and that's what it needs. And I did it over and over again. And eventually my body fell asleep. And so much changed overnight just with that. I could function like a normal human being, how I loved my children again, you know, and wanted to be with them and spend time with them. If you are prone to negative states, depression, anxiety, or stressful reactions, as all of us are, then what happens is often our minds move into these um, cascades of thinking that we could argue are really problem-solving strategies that don't work very well. All of this thinking is a way to resolve your anxiety, except it doesn't really work very well. So what we're trying to do then is to train our ability to be more conscious, to bring a kind of more conscious awareness to experience so that we can catch those moments before everything starts to unravel 
and haul our attention back to where we really are. So if you can do that, then you can begin to disrupt these kinds of cascades of thinking that can get in our way. I think I sold three homes that year, and one of them was my own. <laughs> so in that year and process of trying to shift things, a little book showed up along the way by a woman named Florence Scovel Shin, and it was called The Game of Life and How to Play It. She explains basically that if you have faith in things working out, that they will. And if you wish yourself into a hole, you'll go down the hole. <laughs> you're really inviting the highest plan, so you're not giving dictation. Florence Scovel Shin from Game of Life had a lot of quotes like that. The, the right car for me is already selected. Show the right actions at the right time. Part of what that does is it moves the person out of grasping, forcing, chasing, which are all part of this culture and often part of the manifesting world. I also read a book called The Four Agreements, and it was very simple, you know, but when I read that book, it shifted me again. I, I felt back to myself a little bit more. I started to have sort of just faith that things would work out. So in that year, I went from selling those three homes to selling 33 homes in one year. I kind of think of it as the tyranny of the shoulds, the list of the 40 things that you must do, the list of the 10 critical actions, they stop mattering because you start listening on the inside to the way it's meant to happen for you. And then these actions begin to arise that are very spontaneous and they're your way. Just as Tamara reached her breaking point, yoga was brought to her Silicon Valley workplace as the latest perk and it changed her life. It was during the, the dot-com era, and um, the companies instituted a lot of um, incentive programs um, to keep people happy. <laughs> and um, one of them at our, our company was yoga. And I can't tell you how many times Monday morning rolled around and it's like, oh, I can't, like, can I just call in sick and be like, I don't want to miss yoga. <laughs> it, it, it connected me to myself in a way that I, I, I didn't know before that. It's very in keeping with letting the divine take the lead that what starts to happen, it's absolutely outside of age. It's absolutely outside of the circumstances of how you should behave or what should happen. In the beginning when I um, was leaving, leaving my job, I was sitting with an artist friend of mine and we were just shooting the breeze. We are like, you know, if we could do anything we wanted, like just anything at all, what would it be? And I hear pop out of my own mouth, like, if I could do anything I wanted, I would love to teach yoga. And I was just like, what? <laughs> it, was, it was actually a surprise to me. So in the course of about a month from the time that I uttered the, the dream of, of teaching yoga, I enrolled in a yoga teacher training that I didn't even know existed the month before. The intuitive flow begins to show you the right actions at the right time. Ironically, Einstein himself talked about this a lot. He was saying that so many of the solutions to things that he, problems that he was having, did not come from puzzling with the logical mind over and over or trying to manifest stuff. It came from getting out of the way, going for a walk, opening to the intuitive flow and seeing what was presented. So there's a harmonizing with something larger that has nothing to do with passivity. When it's time to act, you absolutely get shown the actions from inside you. The think and grow rich philosophy impacted so much, uh, m not only my personal life, but lives of my children and, and, and the people around me. Uh, and I said, you know, one day I'm gonna teach this philosophy all over the world. That became my definite major purpose. And then finally, Finally, I got the rights from the Napoleon Foundation to teach this philosophy. See, whatever it is in our mind, and we believe in that thought, that's going to matter. But thoughts will not become things if you don't believe in that thought. We teach this philosophy to our people so it can change their life. They feel good about their life. I think Napoleon Hill sort of viewed as, even though my dad's never met him, I think it's my dad's mentor. 
um, sort of somebody that he relies on in sort of a spiritual context um, that he feels that this individual has massively impacted his life and it's given him the liberty to, to live his life completely free and, and happy. A funny thing is when I, when I started taking this course, I felt intimidated by the people, by my instructors also. And guess what? I became the instructor for that Napoleon Foundation myself. He's made himself available as a source for people so they could eliminate all these limiting beliefs and get away from all this conformity and really just live a courageously purpose-driven life. He's my mentor. He's the greatest there is, that's all I can say. If we can teach our children, they can have, be, and do anything in their life, and that becomes their belief, and you will see our society will be totally different. But here, children are told, you cannot do, you cannot have, you cannot be. Suppose he says, a parent says, oh, I want to be a doctor. Because I remember when I was running a learning center, we'd ask the child, what do you want to be? And the parents would jump in. Oh, he wants to be a doctor, but, but it's okay if he becomes a nurse even. What if that doctor, if we let him become a doctor and find the cure for cancer? Now think about this. See what we did here. Whatever thought we can plant in the mind of the child is going to matter. Matter to a great extent that it can determine not only his future, it can determine the future of all of us. Because one child can imp his thought can impact anything. Meditation is believed to transform the mind from a negative to a positive state and to aid in a deeper connection to the universe. One of the great things I found that kept me succinct and in power through everything has been meditation. I wake up in the morning and I, and I focus on my intention for the day. I read something that gets me into a very creative mindset so I can take things on powerfully. I take 30 minutes in the midday, I just stop and I get silent. and I envision myself in a powerful state. I see myself achieving my dreams and goals. I see myself in full competency. If I see something or I feel something that's disempowering or maybe I'm feeling weakened, I take that 10 minutes of that day and I focus specifically on that feeling or on that emotion and I see the exact opposing thought, what it is I desire to feel and experience. I'm going to bring you now into my special space where I believe all the magic happens. So follow me. This is my altar. This is where I manifest. I have it laden with deities and special found objects from my travels or items that friends have gifted me that are meaningful. The altar space is a great space for me to sit there and really think about what I want to manifest into my life what I want to call in. A lot of times we get overwhelmed and we look at the big picture and we're trying to come up with a quick solution. So my process was definitely, what can I do every day to make this better? I went to my very first uh, nine day silent meditation retreat. The meditation cycles in particular they're effective for the thought processes because it's not just sit down and be silent for eight hours a day because most, most of us would just go crazy if we tried that. So we sit and then we start to move and that actually moves the energy. It starts to still the thoughts. And as we deepen into that practice, there's an awareness that grows that I'm not my thoughts. I think I'm too old, I think I'm too fat, I think I'm not flexible enough, I think I can't teach yoga, but that's not the truth. And so being able to distinguish that, and so as we come closer to having no mind, the truth can actually arise. Yoga and fitness definitely have a connection to uh, thought practice and the power of thought. When we are moving our bodies, whether it's through sport or fitness activity or especially in yoga, the best outcome 
comes from focusing one's mind on a concentrated point. It shifts one from thinking and being in that to-do list part of the mind and instead brings them into a one-centered focus and connection not only with their body, not only with their breath, but most importantly with themselves and their spirit. And then the movement component becomes that much more effective and efficient. Let's spend one minute chanting Om. The musical element is actually one of the foundational practices of yoga. So one of the mantras that we did in our class today was the mantra to Ganesha. And Ganesha is a very dear mantra to me because it is the aspect of removing obstacles. When we chanted to Ganesha, we used a few different sounds. We used the sound Om, we used the sound Gam or Gang, and we used the word Ganapataye and Namaha. When combined together, it becomes this powerful um, spiritual process that connects us to universal energy. Ganesha removes obstacles, so I personally used that mantra for over five years in my life to clear things like negative relationships, um, abusive relationships, um, to clear obstacles in terms of career and abundance and, and wealth anything that was getting in my way. And that comes through a deep belief and a deep inner knowing that I am accessing ancient wisdom through these sounds. It's healed me from stress, anxiety, severe depression, suicidal tendencies. And mantra is, is an ancient healing art that can get one through that. While thought practices become increasingly popular, some are more well-known than others. All facilitate a connection to source energy and creativity. Creativity in every form, all forms, um, help one to settle back into the natural state of who they really are. We know how rigid the egoic structure can be. And it just, I call it an ego spasm. It's like, it's like having to go through this mire to get to the jewels. So basically what I do is I help erase all the crud. Then everything else starts to sparkle without so much effort. Our mind almost has no other place to go but to turn itself uh, back onto the music. So it's a really great practice in focusing, in um, helping to cultivate uh, centered awareness, and especially in empowering thoughts. What I want to say about the, the creative expression in the form of singing and dancing and painting, that's a really big piece of the loving myself. There's a quote by a wonderful spiritual teacher, Ajashanti, what the universe can manifest through you when you get out of the way is far beyond anything the ego can manifest on its own. Often when the ego creates a shopping list of what it wants, it's coming from the very limited perspective of the small self saying, well, what I want next is I need a new house and I need this person and I need that. But in fact, there's a larger vision that often even blocks certain manifestations from occurring because in the larger vision, that's the last thing you need right now. While the law of attraction helps explain positive and negative outcomes, does this way of thinking create a culture of victim blaming? This idea that we as individuals can make or break our lives, right? This is a really North American view, okay? And I think it's nonsense. This idea of manifesting thought, we have to be really 
careful because it's easy to say then, you know what, if you thought differently, you wouldn't have that car accident. You wouldn't lose that job. You wouldn't get that disease. You wouldn't lose that relationship. I think it's simplistic. A few years back, everybody was writing themselves million-dollar checks. I had all these people writing to me going, I wrote myself a million-dollar check. It never came. What did I do wrong? And I'm like, that's not how it works. It's one of the limitations to me of egoic manifesting is it's very focused on getting the agenda that the ego wants. It has nothing to me to do with, oh, if somebody's in alignment, they're going to get the million-dollar check. And if you wrote that check and you didn't get it, you're not in alignment. Like that's, to me, that subtle blame that I think is so painful sometimes in the manifesting world. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. It's often not the person's fault in the least. I think intention is important. I think what you think is important um, in terms of how it affects what you do next but it's not the only thing that has an impact on what happens to us. I just think it's really simplistic. There's so many other variables. There was an applied faith behind my knowing of healing. I knew that if I could make this toe wiggle, there's nothing that can, that can stop me from achieving my visions and goals. It's all about the power of thought. What are you focused on? You will bring on. It will become you. I'm still blown away. And you know, um, I have to say that when I look at what he's accomplished in 10 years, I mean, what is he going to accomplish in the next 10, the next 20? An example of manifesting directly was that I wanted to be an award-winning agent. I wrote down the types of people that I would enjoy working with. That all came to fruition, all of it. I received the award for the top agent in my office for this year out of 126 agents. I would say that's, that's the thing that I would most want to share with people, is like there is just the next baby step. Step out of the box of the things that you think other people think you need to be. My story is a love story. Um, and because I love myself and I let, I let myself be seen, I've taken the risk to, to learn to know myself. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it will achieve. That's a very famous quote by Napoleon Hill. He wrote this book in 1937. And uh, you can imagine it's, it's close to 70, 80 years now. It's absolutely a timeless piece. Because he loves it so much and because it, the book has changed his life to such a degree and because he's so passionate about it, um, he, it, he will do this day and night and, and spread the message of Napoleon Hill and Think and Grow Rich, I think, too anybody and everybody comes across. I just love it. I love it to the extent I don't even sleep when I'm doing this. Because in my sleep, I also i am thinking about the, my God, tomorrow day is going to be awesome day for me again, because I'm, I'm going to impact so many people again. And that's, that's, that's what excites me. Manifestation is all by the thought and by how much faith you have in yourself. Thoughts do manifest whatever you think. It happens. Only thing who stops you is you. What I can say about manifesting in my own life, as I've gone along the journey of deepening my awareness, um, I've come to a place of allowing what wants to come to manifest. I just keep emptying myself, making myself available for what's right, and, and when I get the call, I listen. I love that word, manifest, manifesting. A deep belief in creation and thinking that you can make things happen. I really believe you can make manifest anything you, you truly wish for. Literally, the meaning is, 
everything happens through you rather than by you. That's what I'm talking about. This is saying, how do I invite in a larger force of love to get me out of the way so that its plan for me can occur? The universe knows what's needed in a way that the ego could never know.